welcome all the rise of right wing extremism the most serious and most underestimated threat to the democracy and freedom uh, this is your host amir rana uh, on behalf of uh, overseas progressive pakistanis netherland i welcome you all uh, before starting uh, the, the, uh, going directly uh, to our speakers uh, I like to introduce uh, overseas progressive Pakistanis a little bit. Overseas progressive Pakistanis' purpose uh, is to create a platform for the people of Pakistani origin to pr promote progressive values in a multicultural en environment. To achieve our vision, uh, that is uni uh, unity in diversity. We strive to eliminate exploitation and discrimination through meaningful dialogues. And dialogues doesn't mean this type of dialogues. We also create dialogues on different social media platforms, physically, uh, uh, online, and also physically. Previously, we have been uh, engaged uh, in conducting uh, physical uh, dialogues uh, in Free University Amsterdam, that is called in English Free University in Amsterdam, but due to Corona, uh, we are forced to do it online, and, and it is good that uh, we uh, we uh, we can meet a lot of people uh, from around the globe, and at this moment as well, that uh, above 150 people from around the globe uh, from different parts of the world. Uh, they have registered for this uh, uh, dialogue. So overseas progressive Pakistanis political orientation is clear. Uh, we believe in uh, democracy. We believe in human rights. We believe in minority rights and gender equality. Our religious thoughts are clear that everybody has uh, all the right to uh, have uh, its religious uh, uh, inclination, uh, but we believe in separation of the state and the religion. And the social, uh, socially, we uh, believe in integration, tolerance, acceptance, and harmony. This is just a brief introduction. And now I'm coming to uh, our main topic, the rise of right-wing extremism the most serious and most under, underestimated threat to democracy and freedom. So this dialogue, we shall discuss the rise of far right, its causes, the ideology, its various forms, its relationship with conventional politics and capitalism, its consequences and the threats to democracy and freedom in which we believe. So uh, let me introduce, um, uh, our speakers uh, or panelists today. First, uh, everybody knows him very well, Professor Dr. Ishtiak Ahmed. Uh, he's a Swedish political scientist and author of many books. Uh, he, has, he holds a PhD in political science from Stockholm University. He's Professor of Emeritus of Political Science at Stockholm University. He is also honorary senior fellow of the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. He was a visiting research professor of the Institute of so uh, South Asian Studies, ISAS, National University of Singapore, and at the South Asian Studies program, National University of Singapore from June 2007 to June 2010. He was a visiting professor at the Lahore University of Management Sciences LUMS during 2013 and 15. He is member of the Editorial Advisory Board of Asian Ethnicity, Journal of Punjab Studies, IPRI Journal, Islamabad, and PIPS Research Journal of Conflict and Peace Studies, Islamabad. Uh, I had to uh, reduce his um, uh, introduction because uh, he has a lot of uh, feathers in his uh, uh, cap. Uh, just to uh, give a, uh, a little introduction about his books, Jina, it, it is his uh, recent book, Jina, His Successes and Failures and Role in History. Then previously he wrote The Punjab Bloodied Partition Claims, 
Pakistan, the garrison state, the politics of religion in South and South Asia, the politics of group rights, the Pakistan military in politics, state, nation, and ethnicity in contemporary South Asia, the concept of an Islamic state, and a lot more. Uh, now uh, I'm going to introduce our uh, second uh, panelist, Wahid Bhatti. Uh, most of you have been uh, heard uh, and listened from him because usually uh, he does um, uh, a moderation of Overseas Progressive Pakistanis dialogues online. Wahid Bhatti uh, has been involved in students and uh, trade unions during the time of his studies which include political science. He has always been a tireless voice against exploitation, discrimination, and bigotry, and has supported the struggle for democracy, human rights, gender equality, and equal rights for minorities. These are precisely part of OPP's program and activities because Wahid Bhatti is also founder member, one of the founder members of Overseas Progressive Pakistanis, and he is obviously leading all of us. These, uh, he has moderated, you know, several OVP dialogues, both at the Fry University uh, and online. Uh, one of his core competencies is the skill to grasp the bigger picture and quickly bring the most complex situations down to a single issue. So these are uh, the introductions of uh, our two um, uh, speakers. So just, just tell you, uh, uh, I'm telling you once again, that uh, our speakers would uh, share their thoughts uh, during their short uh, presentations, verbal presentations, and then we would go directly into question answer sessions where you can share your comments, your ideas, you can ask questions, and that part of the program would be longer than uh, uh, our, uh, the speech of our speakers. So first, I want to invite, uh, invite uh, Dr. Ishtiaq Ahmed. So please, Dr. Ishtiaq Ahmed, uh, let me stop sharing and uh, giving you mic. Dr. Ishtiaq, please. Thank you, Amir Rana Sahib. Uh, Overseas Progressive Pakistanis is a family to which I belong and identify with. And today is a double privilege because I have Bahid Bhatti Sahib also on the panel. And I have the deepest respects for him and my colleagues who have worked all their lives for the defense of the rights of the underprivileged, of the dispossessed, of the stigmatized, and of the oppressed. And the topic today, I think, is central to understanding what has gone wrong with this world of ours. Buddha, Guru Nanak, and all the great minds of South Asia talked about the fact that we are a wounded humanity. And healing this wounded humanity is a task we must continue in all our uh, eras and times and ages and definitely today. So the way we do, you know, uh, divided our task is that I will give the overall conceptual theoretical framework of what is right wing extremism. And then Bahid Bhatti Saab will come in with his deep knowledge of the events which have taken place in many parts of the world. You know, just to acquaint people who are not familiar with what is right and what is left, during the French Revolution, in the French Grand Assembly, those deputies who, sought, who sat on the right in the National Assembly of the Assembly President were monarchists and supporters of the old order. While those who sat on the left side were supporters of the revolution and change in favor of the rights of individuals and popular democracy. In the middle sat those who were constitutionalists. So that's how this 
you know, a uh, uh, spectrum from left to right is in the center are always moderates and on the extreme poles are extreme positions of left and right. So what are left-wing ideas? These are ideas about freedom, equality, fraternity of humankind, the indivisibility of the humankind, that whatever our you know, uh, ethnicities, so-called races, religions, sects, at the bottom of all that and at the core of all it, of all that is a shared humanity. That's the basic idea of being left-wing. The left-wing also believes in the rights of individuals as against the idea of an organic group called the nation or the community or whatever. And we also believe that state action and social action must be undertaken to alleviate the suffering of the historically disadvantaged. One great example is from the Indian constitution, which constitutionally introduced 22.5% reservations for the Dalits and the Adivasis, that is the Aboriginal tribes. Without such reform, these two stigmatized oppressed sections of Hindu social order would have stood no chance. So that's a, another example of being left-wing. The left-wing also believes in reform and internationalism as against nationalism. And it relies intellectually on evidence and proof and the scientific method. Now in contrast, what is right-wing? Right-wing is characterized by an emphasis on notions such as traditions, customs, authority, hierarchy, order, duty, tradition, reaction, and nationalism. So these are the two polar extremes. <clears throat> Right-wing extremism then is holding political, religious, or ideological views which sharply divide the in-group, that is your group, from the out-group, whosoever that out-group may be. It could be a race, it could be an ethnicity, it could be a linguistic nationality, it could be a religious group, or it can be a sectarian group. And defines the relationship between the in-group and the out-group as antagonistic to the point that demonizing and dehumanizing the outgroup in words, thoughts, and ideas result in the use of violence against the enemy group. So right-wing extremism is not only the words you use, the symbols you uh, 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 invoke in your speech, but it is also actions which take place. Just to illustrate this, let me give the example of the blasphemy laws of Pakistan. If you look at its wording that by action or symbolic movement or whatever, if you show any disrespect, disrespect to religion or the holy figures of religion, then you can be charged with blasphemy. Now this law is a typical example of right-wing extremism because what we know is that after the introduction of this law, over and over and over again, hapless people have been victimized in Pakistan on grounds of alleged blasphemy. So words lead to action. And extremism is such wording which actually authorizes uh, uh, extreme action. Let me say like this, that before the French Revolution, this is the turning point. This will have to be very quick, as we have been told. Before the French Revolution, the whole world was a world in which hierarchy, that my grandfather, my father, I and my children would have the same profession, the same status in society as has always happened. That was the feeling uh, upheld by the social orders of Asia, Africa, 
and Latin America. And indeed, Europe was the center of all this. You know, about Latin America, maybe I shouldn't be speaking too much because we know so little about it. But definitely the old Asian societies and the old European societies were based on hierarchy, strict hierarchy and duty, not rights. People didn't have rights. They had duties towards the superiors. The turning point in world events is the French Revolution, which for the first time brought forward the idea of citizens bearing inalienable rights. In the 19th century, then you have the socialist movement with Marx and Engels and many others advocating the rights of the working men. They got the right to vote and so on. And then in the 20th century, women get the right to vote. Now, that has been the main change from the 16th centuries onwards, that the era of rights has grow, grew while uh, the old society, the feudal order, the monarchies were on the defensive, became constitutional monarchies in, in many parts of the world, where in other parts of the world, the old order continued. The First World War brought to an end the empires of Europe. The Second World War brought to an end the empires of Asia and Africa. The Second World War was the war launched by right-wing extremist movements. The German Nazis, the Italian fascists, and the Japanese militarists. Their defeat ushered in the era of the United Nations and the whole world was hoping that the new power centers of the world, the United States and the Soviet Union would become the guarantors of world peace and prosperity and cooperation. If you look at the charter of the UN, it is devoted to peace and to human rights economic development and all these things, you know. But what happened was a great tragedy. On uh, the, those who represented the Soviet Union and, and the United States, uh, on the one hand, Marshall Stalin, on the other hand, President Roosevelt, they both had entered the Second World War as partners. And the hope was that the, this partnership will now reconstruct the world in favor of peace, democracy, freedom, and so on. And all evidence shows that the Soviet Union, which had been devastated by the Second World War, was willing to come along. But as tragedy struck, on the 12th of April, 1945, President Roosevelt dies in office. He is succeeded by President Truman, who was a born again Christian a weak president who was under great pressure from the Republicans in the uh, uh, Congress, as well as right-wing uh, uh, Democrats in his own party. And so instead of the Soviet Union and, and the United States becoming, you know, the, the patterns of a new world order, we find a Cold War taking place. When Molotov came to attend the San Francisco you know, meeting for the United Nations, he was rebuked by, uh, uh, by a true man. And later on, the Americans bombed Japan, you know, two atomic bombs, which then made the Soviet Union go for its own uh, uh, hydrogen bombs in 1949. Since then, this project of peace and prosperity and freedom and democracy was sidelined by the ideological competition between these two. Let me read to you what the US National Security Act of 1947 said. It said that in order to contain the spread of communism and Soviet influence, the following should be done all over the world. The military should be declared the guardian of the national interest. Ideas about democracy uh, 
which lead to questioning of world capitalism should be contained. The church should be brought into service to oppose atheism, ideas of secularism, and so on and so forth. Then a very interesting development in American foreign policy is the Eisenhower Dulles Doctrine, which went out without openly saying it, but this is the basic logic that in most of the third world, liberal forces are not in a position to be to confront the Soviet type of communism. So we should we should go and support conservative forces. And when it came to the Muslim world, the idea was that in the Muslim world, Islamism was an ideology which was uh, uh, which could be put into practice to to spread to to contain the influence of the Soviet Union and, and communism. I think this is the overall framework. In the 1960s, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and the jamaat e islami and others were brought into this front. I have this book with me which anyone who wants to study this question, Devil's Game by Robert Dreyfus, an American can read how the Americans and the British promoted Islamism in the Muslim world to counter the spread of secularism, ideas of democracy, freedom, national sovereignty, and so on and so forth. But you know, one of the arguments I've always put forward in my discussions is that the world, despite having superpowers and great powers and regional powers is always anarchic. Out of all this, then we get some changes where the focus of politics moves from Europe into Southwest Asia. First General Zia comes to power in Pakistan the communists come to power in Afghanistan and a revolution is led by Imam Khomeini and other clerics uh, in Iran. And it is the beginning of the so-called Afghan Jihad in which the anti-Soviet, anti-communist project was sponsored by the United States, Britain, Saudi Arabia, China and Egypt. It's an interesting combination and even Israel. Muslim warriors were recruited from all over the world, brought to Peshawar, trained into the use of weapons and, commit, and committed to the war against the Red Army. It also resulted what I have called in one of my writings as globalization in reverse, that the two centers of Islamism which emerged, one was Iran and then Saudi Arabia, they started promoting their ideologies all over the world. Already, you know, in Europe, and I, I leave this for Vahid Bhakti Sahib to go into details. After the Second World War, millions of people from the former colonies had come looking for work, settled, and there was an uneasy relationship between the host societies and the settlers. And one can say that because of the devastation of the Second World War, a natural sympathy for the minorities existed in the Western uh, 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 democratic circles. So the Western democracies did build, did invest in open democratic societies. And in the 1970s, late 1970s, the citizenship laws were also liberalized and people in very large numbers became citizens of the states in which we, they were living. Nothing of the sort had ever happened in the 2,500 years of history recorded that people were so easily given citizenship. But then the irony, the tragedy is that the Iranian revolution takes place. The Saudis come in, 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 in opposition to Iran and they then started pumping dollars and money um, 
uh, among Muslim settlers in the uh, in the West, telling them to isolate themselves from Western societies, which in turn then resulted in reactions from the host anti-immigration forces. They gained, uh, uh, you know, democratic strength, or you can say electoral strength by focusing on the threats posed by this new factor, the cultural factor, the anti-democratic, the idea of women being considered of secondary nature, you know, burqa and niqab and, and you name it and all was there. So you find these two forces uh, mutually reinforcing one another. Then comes, of course, the great, uh, the, the great uh, 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 tragedy of 9-11-2001, when people who were trained to fight the Soviet Union then turned against their own patrons and, and ordered uh, uh, terrorist attacks on the United States. I know some people don't believe this ever happened. They think that the Israelis and the Americans did it which of course is our susceptibility to conspiracy theories, but there's enough evidence to, 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 to establish that this was done but by Al-Qaeda and the results are all before you. I would not continue very long because I want Bahid Saab also to speak. I would say that the next stage in all this is then Bush's war on terror, which for some reason, instead of focusing on Al-Qaeda and these people shifted the uh, uh, attention to Iraq and destroyed Iraq and destabilized the Middle East, creating another wave of refugees coming into Europe. As they came in, the right-wing forces believing in the purity of the old Dutch nation, the Swedish nation, the Christian roots of their societies, finding Islam, challenging them culturally at workplaces, in the marketplaces. So I think this is the sad sort of situation which has occurred. Just before I leave the floor to uh, Vahid Bhatti Saab, let me say a few words about how it impacted our region, South Asia. The Afghan Jihad comes to an end in 19... 89, and then the Muslim uh, Pakistani Mujahideen turned their attention to the Indian Kashmir. And some units then go and carry out terrorist attacks in the rest of India. Most infamously, the attack on Mumbai on the 26th of November, uh, 2008. Already, a Hindu right wing existed from the time of the partition. And that had been sidelined after the, after the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. They started gaining now a voice saying that if the partition was a partition of India on the basis of religion, what are Muslims doing in India? And they are a fifth column, not loyal to India and so on and so forth. And the BJP has then won elections in 1996, then 1998 uh, under Vajpayee Saab, who tried to actually change the whole focus by going to the Lahore Minar, signing the Lahore Accord, but we did Kargil. And after Kargil, then of course, we now have a BJP government which says tit for tat, if you are going to confront us with extremism, we will do the same to you. And no doubt some of the measures introduced like the, uh, you know, this, 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 who can qualify for uh, uh, political asylum in India, the only exclusion are Muslims. So you can see that there is a majoritarian anti-Muslim thrust to Indian uh, uh, politics. And in Pakistan, I need not uh, speak in great depth because I've already mentioned the blasphemy law, which on a daily basis strikes terror in the hearts of anyone who wants to think freely. 
who wants to exercise freedom to express himself and those who believe in the equality and the unity of human kind thank you very much thank you very much doctor uh, uh, for your uh, uh, for actually uh, setting up uh, the context uh, of our discussion so uh, as you have said that uh, it is all about uh, uh, reciprocate ac actions about uh, uh, the islamists and um, uh, in the western uh, right wing uh, extremists so i would like to um, here uh, give the mic to uh, wahid bhatti sahab wahid bhatti sahab uh, would uh, carry on this discussion and give us another perspective that is uh, uh, mostly related to the west please wahid bhatti sahab uh, thank you thanks uh, amir rana uh, greetings to everyone and uh, it is uh, really a great privilege uh, to to have this opportunity to speak from this platform and particularly a great privilege to to sit here with the dr ishtia kamal who is uh, not only an amazing political scientist and a writer of uh, several fantastic books but he is a big source of inspiration for opp and for all of us with his uh, youthful enthusiasm and his uh, <laughs> his insights and thanks dr sa for giving us a brilliant insight into into the historical perspective of uh, of uh, right and left wing when you were talking about right and left on a light hearted side uh, a joke crossed my mind which was uh, very popular during the time of george w bush that a doctor examined him and he said mr bush in your right brain there is nothing left and in your left brain there is nothing right so that was uh, his definition of uh, right and left now just on a serious note now we have a very important topic topic today as uh, dr ishtiak has set it up it's a very broad topic and for the next 15 minutes or so i will try to focus on some of the aspects uh, in particular the west and i will talk through it uh, for for a few minutes uh, after my talk uh, i am sure we will have a uh, plenty of time oh, it's never plenty of time but we will have time to uh, discuss and to have questions and answers while preparing on this topic a lot of progressive uh, uh, persons inspired me and uh, there are quite a lot but particularly three one was dr ishtiak another professor kashmode and noam shomsky i read quite a few articles uh, and interviews uh, from them and they were very insightful so i really have to mention that that uh, they helped me now dr ishtaq defined that the, the rise of uh, where it came from but i will focus a bit more on the contemporary situation and more recent history the right wing extremism is usually defined as a specific ideology which is characterized by anti democratic opposition towards equality so this is what uh, dr sab also mentioned it's mostly associated with racism with xenophobia with exclusionary nationalism with the eco fascism conspiracy theories and authoritarianism it is inherently an anti democratic uh, philosophy and in many cases it legitimizes the use of violence uh, and uh, uh, use of uh, different means to reach their goals now it has many dimensions we are we unfortunately cannot cover them all it has obviously a very big and a strong political dimensions which we all see today but it also has a theologic theological dimension which we also see in in several countries in in afghanistan and pakistan and theological dimensions are more to be seen in towards asia and less actually in in europe and the west then there is a ritual dimension there is a rituality around this whole discourse and around this whole ideology how they present themselves how they structure themselves the symbolism the uniforms the speeches and uh, and and some some of the historical symbols they use to to create that impact and there is obviously a big social dimension of it because they want to break down the prevailing uh, social dimension we have a few examples if we look at uh, the base in america for example afd in germany the proud boys in the usa uh, freedom party in austria or flamse belang i mean you can keep quoting 
dozens of examples of these groups and parties which exactly say the same thing. If you take base, for example, it's, uh, it's their guru, Rinaldo Nazaro and James Mason, their ideologue, they talk about total destruction of the existing society and build a new society from the ashes. And it's in a way not very different than what uh, Milton Friedman, the economist said, says about neoliberalism, that they have to destroy the old system to create the new one. And they did it, uh, they showed it how to do it, for example, in Chile. Now, over the last couple of decades, we have seen the rise of this political phenomena, phenomena which uh, we are say, calling the right-wing extremism. Ideologically, uh, this author authoritarian populism sits on the far right of the political spectrum. In fact, they have pushed the entire political spectrum towards the right. If we see the parties which used to be right or center, they all have moved towards right. Even 30 years ago, what used to call themselves left, they have mostly moved towards the center. So this whole pressure from the, from the right wing and from the populist uh, 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 side, they have pushed the entire political spectrum to the right. I mean, the obvious examples, and these are the people who are running the states, they are not part of the groups or some small guys. I mean, look at Viktor Orban in Hungary what kind of policies he has, how he's running within the European Union, within a bloc which stands up for human rights and democracy, etc. Look at Erdogan in Turkey, look at Bolsonaro in Brazil, look at Duterte in Philippines, and to top it all, we have uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, and they are all elected people who not only entered the mainstream politics, but they took over large countries and they have been ruling them or they are still ruling them. Now, there are lots of differences among them, but what is common across them? The common elements are that they all undermine democracy. One by one, if you look at what they have been doing in your last years, they are categorically undermining the democracy. They are undermining all forms of collective decision-making because the collectiveness, collectiveness, the solidarity within the society, they want to break it down. Then they are all forming or have formed autocratic regimes. They use neo-fascist kind of rhetoric, extreme nationalism, delusion of identity, etc., as their basic arguments. They are against the freedom of press. They believe in conspiracy theories. They have total disregard for the facts. In, actually, Mr. Trump has been very proudly saying, talking about his own alternative facts. They don't believe in science. They are big users of social media and they are big spreaders of misinformation. Now, these are their, some of their core attributes, which all of them share. Now, just imagine the world's most powerful man or the president of the world's more, most powerful country, Trump. He, when he rules a, the biggest country, he actually provides all the populist movements in the world a strong legitimacy. Now, how he has ruled America and how he left by attacking Capitol Hill that speaks volumes actually for itself. Now, when these events were happening, many people seem to be surprised by this sudden, uh, the, the inverted comma, sudden rise of the right extremists. We shouldn't be surprised. Actually, we are not, because many progressive writers, including OPP and Dr. Ishtiak, many progressive analysts, intellectual activists, and politicians have been continuously warning about this, this thing. In fact, the the governments have been warned by their intelligence agencies that the biggest threat in future is coming from the right wing, but they were, it was ignored. But look at the history of all these people. Dr. Ishtiak mentioned some of the historical events, but and Iran in particular, but that starts with the coup in 1953, when Mossadegh elected uh, president of Iran was, was overthrown. Then we had uh, Guatemala in 1954. Uh, similar thing happened there. Chile, uh, Allende in 1973, Cuba, an ongoing story, Afghanistan, an ongoing story. So they have been installing historically dictators. They have been paying bribes. They have not shun away from kidnappings, assassinations, fermenting strikes and creating economic chaos, including military coups. So this is the history where this, this was the breeding ground and the source of uh, 
uh, right-wing extremism in the, in the recent history. And it's not only the USA, because I'm using more examples from the America, but all their allies, they were all in it together. Nobody is less, nobody is more. I mean, look at Germany's CSU, uh, uh, Christian, Christian Union. Even in 70s, they openly supported the Grey Wolves, uh, the fascist group in Turkey. Uh, and all the, 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 the fascist groups in Germany, neo-fascist groups, they were supported by them. Now, with this history, how can we be surprised that the, that the right-wing extremism has risen uh, and has created the events like Oklahoma City bombing uh, by, by Timothy McVeigh or Christchurch mosque shootings by Brenton Harrison Tarrant in, in 2019, very recently. In Germany recently, the NS underground group, NSU, they carried out target killings of nine immigrants. Now, this is not isolated event killing nine, nine immigrants. We had a ma massacre of uh, uh, Otoya in Norway. And it's like yesterday, Priyanta Kumara's killing in Shalcote in 2021, and all other events of burning churches, etc., which is happening in, uh, in, in Pakistan. Now, all these people, they draw inspirations from these incidents, and they use them as an evidence of their successes, because they have fantastic access now to media, and all these events, they, they actually give them more energy and kind of uh, give them more togetherness, uh, and, and we tend to call them incidents. They're not incidents. Incident is if something happens, uh, an ind individual act. But because the, some of the examples I mentioned, they require huge planning, they require preparations, they require funding, and then there is a lot of passive support. Because if you see these things happening, now many people, they look the other way. They don't, uh, they don't, don't feel bothered by this. Now, this, with this kind of history, uh, we shouldn't be surprised. Now, I want to quote uh, Robert Kennedy, not the best person to quote in this context, but he, he said, what is objectionable, what is dangerous about extremists, it no, is not that they are extreme, but that they are intolerant. The evil is not what they say about their cause, but what they say about their opponents, because what they say about their opponents is more dangerous because they don't want just to spread their ideology, they want total destruction of their opponents. And that's what makes them much, much more. Dis di now, let me jump to another aspect of, of this history. The history of extremism, extremism in the West is essentially the history of anger, humiliation, discrimination, economic disparity, and alienation. But also the history of ideology and belief. Obviously, that also played a role. It is, to a great extent, the history of neoliberalism. And why I say that, if you look at the, the belief that the market should be free and it should drive everything, it should decide any, everything. Not only the economy, but pretty much how the entire state is run. Now, when, once free market is started, neoliberalism is, neoliberalism is started, we ended up creating a world economy in which governments had absolutely no role or very, very minor role the outsourcing, the mergers, the takeovers and acquisitions, the disappearance of industries, which were national pride. I mean, every country had uh, industries were, were the pride of the nation. And the industrial, traditional industrial jobs, the so-called blue collar jobs, the, the workforce, their move or shift from the West to the developing countries, the power of the multinationals, the, the, the social media, all this together, created a situation where working class was completely disintegrated and disoriented and they lost their power. All the trade unions become very, very weak. The solidarity among the working class was diluted and individualism and opportunism took over in place of solidarity. Now, other aspect of neoliberal market or economy is immigration, which doctors have also pointed out, not only as a consequence of the Second World War when the the, the colonies, people from the previous colonies moved uh, to the colonizers countries, but also the neoliberal economy, because the, the basis of neoliberal global market uh, economy, the base, one of the basic principles is free movement of goods and people. And otherwise you cannot have a free market. Now this gave them cheaper labor uh, from other countries. 
This created a competition within the working class, and this pushed the wages down uh, to, the, to the minimum, uh, to, to lesser as they were. And the exploitation took a completely different form. The slavery took a completely different form. And as a consequence, the job protection was completely undermined. Enormous wealth was created, but it was accumulated in, in very few, among very few people. Now, very recently, the, the Paris-based uh, World Equality, Inequality Lab did a research, and they found out that during this uh, last year, 100 million people sank into the extreme poverty. At the same time, the richest 10% of the population of the world now takes 52% of the global income. And guess what? The poorest half, the 50, lower 50% 50 population of the entire world possesses only 8% of the global income. Now, this is the disparity uh, which, we, which was the consequence of this neocolonialism, no, not neocolonial, neoliberalism. And not to forget all the wars which have been imposed on the world from Iraq to Libya to, to you name it, uh, you, you got it. And because of the immigration and a lot of people, people moving from different countries, they brought their cultures, their religion, their other influences. And that is resulted in, and Europe was moving more and more towards secularism. And during last 15 years, I read somewhere that 450 churches have been closed down in Europe. And at the same time, 1,200 mosques have been built. Now, I'm not suggesting at all that they shouldn't be built because people should have their places of worship. But all this, the, the, all the points I have just mentioned, they all had a profound effect on the societies, in particular in the Western world, where they were not used to this kind of development. And they were leading the in industries, they had their prides, etc. Now, this with this, the entire political spectrum, they moved towards the light. The left and the center left and the mainstream parties, they were also swept away by the wave of privatization and globalization. I mean, something which started in Chile and became Reaganism and Thatcherism, it took over everyone by storm, whether it was Labour Party, whether it was uh, Pefedea in Holland, or it was SPD in Germany. All these central left, mainstream left parties, they all went for privatization. If you were, if you wouldn't do that, you will be left behind and you had to win the next election. So you adapted and took over the populist slogans of the right wing parties. So all these people that came under the pressure to adopt populist slogans and policies. Uh, although, as I said, the intelligence agencies and the progressives, they have been warning them about the threat. And Dr. Sava also mentioned the 9-11 did it then. Uh, exactly, that was one of the turning points. Uh, and why was the, the uh, governments ignoring the right-wing threat? Because largely because of 9-11, when they saw a much bigger threat from outside, which they call the uh, Islamic Jihad terrorism or whatever name they gave it. <clears throat> so you always try to unite against the threat from outside first, and you ignore the threat which is from inside. That, that always happens, or mostly happens. So all the attention, it went towards uh, against jihadist terrorism. During that period, one measurement suggests that 350% more attention was given to Muslim or Islamic terrorism in the press uh, as compared to the right-wing terrorism, which was in many ways more dangerous, but didn't get much, uh, much, much uh, mentions in the press. But it, resulted also in lots of positive movements. As we noticed today, we had Black Lives Matter, we have gender equality movements, uh, we have Me Too, we have environmental movements, etc. So we did on balance also got something positive out of it. Uh, the parties, they, I, uh, I, I will skip that for the, for the sake of uh, uh, time, because uh, there were many parties which actually um, came into the parliaments through election, and you know all about them because the, the uh, whether it was Hungary, Austria, Switzerland, Denmark, Belgium, or Finland, Sweden, France, you saw that the, the, the right-wing uh, parties or groups, they started getting something between eight, nine percent to 40, 42% of the votes among public. Now, what caused this kind of reaction also among people? 
the questions in front of us are, do people really vote for the far right candidates because they support their agenda? Or is it a protest against the vote, against the hatred elites uh, who dominate the political establishment? I mean, it's an expression of hatred against the establishment, or is it, a, is it really support of their agenda? Is economic anxiety driving this support for far right? Or is it racism, xenophobia, and cultural resentment? Because Dr. Ishtak also mentioned cultural resentment, because that's also the, the, the right-wing extremists ride on this wave of that your culture is under threat, your race is under threat, your identity is under threat. Has media played a role in fueling the far right's narratives? Uh, and to what extent? Has neoliberalism and the extreme wealth inequality created the condition to make the, uh, to create the uh, situation in which far right can can uh, can win. Just maybe a word about media because media had played a role. I mean, uh, Donald Trump declared it as a public enemy because any media which was against him was a public enemy. But media itself, as an industry, went through enormous uh, transformation because of the privatization. Now, almost all media, with some exceptions are pretty much driven by, by the profit motive. But if you are driven by profit motive and not by journalism, that means that your focus is on the kind of topics and news and items which sell, which generate money, which generate public interest, which generate sensation. So they were mostly crime, corruption, immigration, and the sensational statements and activities by the far right. Uh, so they, they went with this wave, but in fact, there is not much media which really supports uh, uh, supports the right wing extremists, with the exception of a couple of Fox News and so forth and so forth. So, coming to Islamic countries where Dr. Saab left, uh, because Islamic countries they have a slightly different history. They, they don't have that history I just uh, briefly mentioned about uh, about the West, uh, but they have a. a peculiar history about internal and their own external conflicts and violence and really dysfunctional governments, authoritarianism, authoritarianism corruption, lack of freedoms, lack of welfare governments, uh, lack of rule of law, a use of religion, not only by the imperialist powers, but also by their own governments. They, they, uh, and to, to close it, I, again, not the best person to quote, uh, Benazir Bhutto, she said once, extremism can flourish only in an environment where basic governmental social responsibility for the welfare of the people is neglected. So this is, this is our story. Political dictatorship and social hopelessness create the desperation that fuels the religious extremism. Now with this, uh, I would like to hand it back to Amir Rana. Uh, and thank you very much for listening and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Wahid uh, Bhatti sahab. And uh, now we uh, are going to open up uh, the discussion, question answer session. Uh, I request all of the participants to please uh, raise your hands. There is uh, an icon uh, if they want to question, uh, want question or want to share something that is related to this discussion. So, in um, yeah. Uh, I've seen Sabda uh, Zedi Saab uh, for the question, but first uh, I want to ask one question. It is from me. Uh, in, yeah, it, it is all about uh, that uh, Dr. Ishtiak and Mahid Bhatti. I've seen that uh, uh, this right-wing extremism or right-wing notion is more in the Asia, and so especially in the uh, Middle East and Southeast Asia or Asia, and then in the West. But I haven't seen it, in, uh, uh, or uh, uh, I think there is no uh, more attention towards uh, given towards Africa and Southeast Asia. Uh, is this phenomenon uh, not prevailing over there, or we just don't know about that? Uh, would you like me to uh, respond? Please, please. Well, when it came to Africa, remember, Africa's history is very different from the rest of the world. Africa was brutalized, exploited by 
all other continents when they got a chance so for them this feeling of racism the way <laughs> it's part of the european middle eastern islamic indian civilizations is very different but they had tribal warfares and then during the cold war we remember patrice lumumba and all these reformers you know who wanted to build uh, you know self reliant african states were overthrown by by uh, uh, american and uh, western imperialism you know belgium was involved france was involved great britain was in, involved in in destabilizing africa uh, so the african situation is a bit different southeast asia because they have done very well economically you know apart from the european union the only market although it doesn't work so much as a market as as much as an area of cooperation is southeast asia asian countries they have all done very well by restricting democracy but ensuring that the state elites go out and and cater for the needs of the population so the resentment we find in pakistan or in india and elsewhere is not there because the people in general have their needs served well by the elites they may not have the same sort of freedom of expression and uh, you know free you know uh, 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 free and open uh, 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 newspaper traditions and so on when i was in singapore and then also in malaysia i noted that the newspapers never wrote anything critical about the government but you come to india and pakistan and we are a very argumentative people so here you have a lot of freedom for the press not withstanding all the restrictions you don't have that in southeast asia so like china they have they have they have sort of restricted the freedom of of speech but served them well in terms of delivering basic services so that's i think this is how the two parts that you identified as an exception i think explain why they are not reflecting the same sort of trends as elsewhere thank you doctor uh, safdar uh, can you please ask your question unmute yourself please okay um first of all uh, hello to all friends uh, my question is actually to dr ishtia uh, in his start of his speech he told something about um a partnership against soviet union in afghanistan combating communism the partnership of uh, america europe uh, uk and iran saudi arabia egypt and china well the partnership of united states and europe uh, and saudi arabia is pretty understandable to me but the partnership of iran saudi arabia and china against soviet union is a, a bit mystery to me so can you please explain how what united states was in term enemy of iran but against soviet union uh, iran was partner of united states and saudi arabia so it's it, it's a mystery to me so can you explain to me uh sabdar zadi sahab i think you didn't catch me properly i didn't mention iran as part of that alliance not at all i think when they play the the recording you will notice it iran was not included there iran and saudi arabia have played a part in this by waging the sectarian wars against one another and that sectarian war has been conducted in pakistan it has been conducted in 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 europe by funding shia mosques versus sunni mosques and both states telling their people not to integrate with the local societies keep away from them and work towards the revolution let me uh, uh, further explain this you know if you look at the writings of sayyid qutb of the muslim brotherhood or sayyid madudi Mahdu, or imam khomeini all three are agreed 
that Islam has mandated Muslims to carry out a world revolution. This is what I call globalization in reverse to establish the will of God on the whole universe. And they have pursued it, Iran and Saudi Arabia, because of all the funds they have there at their disposal. So I didn't say that uh, in the Afghan Jihad and so on, Iran was a part of it. No, no, no. I'm saying that Iran and Saudi Arabia entered into a sectarian war uh, almost simultaneously. So that's the difference. Because when Iran made the revolution, they challenged Saudi supremacy, saying that they are not the rulers of the Muslim world. We represent true Islam. And I remember in Pakistan, this was debated a lot. And so that's happened concurrently at about the same time. But the tracks are very different. So I think you misunderstood. In the original, by the way, Iran, uh, reg uh, regarding China, yes, if you look at my book, Pakistan, the Garrison State, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, sorry, uh, China gave training uh, uh, facilities to the Mujahideen who took part in the anti-Soviet campaign in Afghanistan. And $400 million were also given by China. So their involvement is 100%. Iran, I didn't mention in that context. OK, thank you very much. It's clear. Sorry. Kessel, can you please uh, unmute yourself? Ask your question. Uh, thank you, Amir Bhai. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ishtiak and uh, uh, for uh, you know like uh, giving this uh, elaborate uh, introduction and discussion about the topic you know um, so uh, short introduction about myself you know I'm working as a professor in one of the public universities here in Lahore you know and I would like to talk on two accounts um, regarding the rise in extremism in Pakistan you know like the thing which is being mentioned by Dr. Ishtiak and also touched upon by uh, by Isad, you know, about uh, the section 295C, uh, which was being introduced by General Zia. Uh, today, there was a very nice column in uh, Dawn, you know, uh, from Nadim F. Paracha, where, uh, you know, like uh, he showed the data that how, uh, you know, like when the Pakistan came into being and uh, um, until 1985 or 86, you know, like, uh, uh, when this 295C was not being introduced and there was 295B, which was uh, for the life imprisonment if you are committing a blasphemy, you know. So there were only uh, 75 registered cases. But once this 295C was added into the constitution, you know, like which is uh, the death penalty, uh, you know, for uh, committing a blasphemy, uh, you know, there have been a rise in the registered cases, you know. So uh, the data suggests, you know, like uh, this also, uh, you know, goes in connection with the, uh, the brutal killing of Priyanta Kumara, uh, you know, uh, a few weeks ago, a week ago or something like that, that, uh, you know, how, how, how the state laws, they impact uh, the masses in a way, you know, that, uh, that they, uh, yeah, that they can move towards the extreme measures, like uh, killing people, you know. Uh, so it is it is more of a statement or uh, what I thought, uh, you know, like I should add to uh, what our uh, esteemed, uh, you know, uh, panelists were talking about. Uh, my second account would be uh, regarding my own experience, you know, while uh, because I did my PhD from Netherlands and I've been teaching for now three years in Pakistan, you know, and I'm dealing with students on everyday basis, you know, uh, and when we talk to them, uh, you know, regarding any of these sensitive issues, you know. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, this is uh, very important to mention that, uh, you know, like uh, this thing is spread on the root level, you know, like uh, grassroots level, as far as uh, extremist ideology is concerned, you know, because um, the generation that has uh, grown up after the 80s or grown up in the 80s or the 90s, and 2000, you know, like uh, people who are studying in bachelor's or master's who are going to take up the reins of the country in the future, uh, they show 
you know, um, yeah, inclination or tendency toward these extremist ideologies. Many of my students, you know, like while I was talking with them, you know, two of the students, uh, they supported this thing, you know, because they said that if uh, he has done this thing, you know, like Priyanka Kumara, then uh, he should be punished with this. And uh, these things are shocking to me, you know, and uh, that um, actually I'm happy to be part of this forum where I can talk openly about these things, but obviously, you know, like, uh, like they have been talking about this, that you cannot, you know, like uh, openly say anything, you know, and honestly speaking, I am sitting in Lahore right now. I would like to tell you all of you, you know, that, that I'm scared. We are scared because, you know, like uh, we feel that you never know, you know, like where the things are coming from, like, what are the people thinking? And like I'm telling you that obviously, you know, one of, uh, yeah, one of the motives of you coming back to Pakistan, you know, obviously you're, you, you want to bring out that cultural change and that, you know, like the progressive values that you want to inculcate into your students, you know, because you see them as the future of Pakistan, you know. So the trend is dangerous. Uh, and that demotivates the academic community who is progressive and although, you know, like uh, my field of uh, yeah, specialization is community medicine, you know, but we do talk about psychology, neuroscience, and uh, we do involve this political thinking into uh, some of our epidemiological thinking. So I don't know it's, if we can take some, uh, some comments from, uh, or maybe let's say we can put it that way that maybe you can guide us, the academics in Pakistan, you know, that, uh, how do they take up this thing? You know, like how do they first themselves cope with this thing? How can they share their progressive uh, values or thinking with the students uh, in a in a garb of where they are not getting killed? Or if you see what I mean, you know. Because, yeah. Thank you, Kesha. Thank yeah, you. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry for the long question. Yeah. But, no, 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 uh, no, 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 no. Yeah. It's it's good uh, because it is a dialogue, and we encourage people to share their experiences and it is a very uh, legitimate question uh, uh, rather i would say the um, uh, th this feeling uh, that uh, despite uh, uh, having um, you know a, a good progressive thought and uh, you are um, a professor you are unable to uh, uh, to, to promote progressive uh, mindset uh, among your uh, students. So, uh, Dr. Ishak, would you please? Um, no, I think I will that? leave his up to respond. He must be. Yeah, please. I mean, okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's a, it's a very difficult one because you, you, uh, Kesar, uh, yeah, we know each other pretty well. Uh, that, that you guys are holding up the flag there and taking all these risks. Uh, it's uh, very admirable and very courageous of you. Uh, I wish really we had some some couple of golden tips for you how to but I think the the best thing is there are lots and lots of people like you you know them you see them on the social media uh, people doing this kind of work and raising their voice against uh, injustices uh, from different different platforms so I think that the best thing would be really to 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 broaden your base to uh, join hands with like-minded groups and people and uh, create a, a visible platform which has the ability to, to stand up against, uh, against all these odds. I know it's extremely, extremely hard for you guys because we have, uh, I think it's uh, Junaid also uh, in prison for 10 years. <laughs> Uh, so we we have this situation. I think the 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 only advice, honestly, I can give is uh, yeah. See, the Tyra Tyra Abdullah is there. Talk to her. <laughs> Perhaps she's mentioning yeah, Professor Jun uh, Fees Junaid Fees. Uh, so I think there are so many groups, so many groups we know from social media and from personal contacts. I think we, uh, if you want, we can share the contacts with you. Uh, so you have uh, some support on the ground uh, and uh, and carry on doing what you are doing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Malik Ishlaq, sir. 
السلام علیکم جی سبھی دوستوں کو اگر اجازت ہو تو میں اردو میں بات کر لوں جی 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 پلیز اچھا ڈاکٹر اشتیاق صاحب اور وحید بٹی صاحب بہت اچھا اپنے مقالے پیش کیے اور بہت ہی مزہ آیا میں سوچ رہا ہوں کہ جب ہم کبھی سیونٹیز میں نوجوان تھے جوان تھے اور پڑھا کرتے تھے تعلیمی جو ہمارے اسکول ہیں تو ہمارے ساتھ شیعہ سنی وہابی ہر مذہب کے عیسائی وغیرہ سارے ایک قسم کے دوست پڑھتے تھے اور کبھی ہمیں کسی قسم کی کوئی کسی سے بھی نفرت اور کبھی ہمیں جاننے کی بھی ضرورت نہیں تھی پیش آئی کہ یہ کس فرقے سے ہے یا کس مذہب سے اس وقت ایک لبرلزم تھا یا سبھی ایک دوسرے کو برداشت کرتے تھے میں ایک بات جاننا چاہوں گا آپ دوستوں سے اور جہاں تک میری اپنی سوچ ہے کہ میں سمجھتا ہوں کہ جنرل ضیاء کے آنے سے پاکستان کے نصاب میں جو تبدیلیاں ہوئی ہیں اس کے بعد جو رائٹ ونگروں نے مشرف کے دور میں کچھ تبدیلیاں کی ہیں اور جو اب کی جا رہی ہیں اور اس کے علاوہ بذات خود ریاست پاکستان رائٹ ونگ ایکسٹریمزم کو بڑھانے کے لیے اور اپنے مختلف جو ہے مفادات کے لیے اور اس کے علاوہ جو اس وقت سوشل میڈیا ہے جو انہیں راس آ گیا ہے ایکسٹریزم ایکسٹریزمزم کو بڑھانے کے لیے یہ تین چار ایسے فیکٹر ہیں جس سے پاکستان میں اور خصوصاً ایشیا میں پاکستان انڈیا نیپال وغیرہ میں بہت زیادہ شدت پسندی جو ہے مذہبی شدت پسندی بڑھ رہی ہے تو کیا آپ سمجھتے ہیں کہ کسی صورت بھی ریاست پاکستان اس کو روکنے کے لیے کوئی کوشش کرے گی یا کوشش کر سکتی ہے یا یہ روک سکتی ہے اور دوسرا یہ ہے کہ کیا یہی مذہبی انتہا پسندی یورپ میں بھی آگے بڑھ سکتی ہے کیونکہ ہمیں تو اپنی آنے والی نسلوں کے لیے ادھر خوف محسوس ہو رہا ہے کہ اگر ایسی ہی مثالیں جو کہ ہمارے ایشیا میں یا پاکستان میں موجود ہیں ہو رہی ہیں اگر ایسا کوئی رجحان یورپ میں بڑھ گیا تو پھر کیا صورتحال بنے جی سر بات یہ ہے کہ ملک صاحب ملک صاحب نے جو یہ اپنا بتایا ہمیں تو میں ٹوٹلی اگری کرتا ہوں فرق اتنا ہے کہ سیونٹیز کے اندر پولرائزیشن جو ہوئی تھی نا وہاں پہ جو سو کالڈ انگریزوں کے دور کا ابھی ایک لبرل انفلوئنس چل رہا تھا وہ ختم ہو گیا ادھر بھٹو صاحب آئے ادھر مودودی نے اپنا وہ جو ہے مورچہ کھڑا کر لیا اور ضیاء کی گراؤنڈ پیدا کرنے میں بھٹو صاحب کا بھی رول ہے انہوں نے نائنٹین سیونٹی سیون کے الیکشن میں یہ ان کے مینیفیسٹو میں تھا کہ دس جماعت تک قرآن شریف جو ہے وہ ہم پڑھائیں گے پاکستان میں ہر کلاس میں اور احمدیوں کو غیر مسلم قرار تو آپ کی نیشنل اسمبلی نے دیے نا ود آؤٹ اینی ایکسیپشن ضیاء نے ہی ایز میڈ کیپٹل آؤٹ آف دا آؤٹ آف دا مارل بینک رپسی آف دا پاکستان لیجسلیٹرس اس نے اس کے اوپر بلڈ کیا ہے اور اپنی نفرتوں کا جو پہاڑ ہے اس پہ کنسٹرکٹ کیا ہے لیکن اگر مجھ سے سچی بات پوچھے تو یہ تو نائنٹین فورٹی سیون سے پہلے بھی پاکستان کا نعرہ کیا لا الہ الا اللہ اور ہندوؤں کو اور سکھوں کو ڈیمونائز کرنا جب وہ چلے گئے تو اسی ٹو نیشن تھیری کے اندر پھر سوال ہوا کہ ہوز مسلم اگر یہ مسلمانوں کی سٹیٹ ہے تو کون سا اسلام ہے جو وہ اپلائی کرے تو وہاں سے ففٹی تھری کی اینٹی ایم ڈی ایم موومنٹ نکلی وہ ذرا دبائی گئی تو جب دوبارہ ایک عوامی تحریک چلی پیپلز پارٹی کی تو رائٹ ونگ نے اس کو کنفرنٹ کیا اور بعد میں جیسے آپ نے بتایا ہے جنرل سیاہ از دا کلبینیشن آف اے پروسیس وچ از انہیرنٹ ٹو دا ہول آئیڈیالوجی آف ٹو نیشنس کہ اگر آپ کا مذہب میرا نہیں ہے تو آپ میرے دشمن ہیں اب مذہب کے علاوہ آپ سیکٹ کو لے آتے ہیں آرگیومنٹ تو وہی ہے نا مذہب آپ نکال دیں سیکٹ آ جائیں تو اس پہ پھر جھگڑا ہوتا ہے شیعہ سنی ٹیررزم نہیں ہوئی نائنٹیز میں امام باڑوں میں جا کے لوگوں نے دفن دفن کرنے لوگ آئے ہوئے تھے ان کو گولیاں ماری ہیں اور سنیوں کی مسجدوں میں بھی گولیاں چلی ہیں تو یہ سارا ایک پروسیس ہے اور محل کیسر صاحب نے ایک بات کی تھی جو میں آئی وڈ لائک ٹو ایڈ 
कि ठीक है ये जो है ना ब्लैसमी लॉ ये नवाज शरीफ के दौर में जो है चेंज हुई थी कि लाइफ इम्प्रेजमेंट को खत्म कर दिया गया था और डेथ कैपिटल पनिशमेंट सिर्फ रखी गई थी तो जिया के बाद भी जो इलेक्टेड गवर्नमेंट्स हैं उन्होंने भी यही हरकतें की हैं पाकिस्तान का प्रॉब्लम ये है कि एक दफा इस्लाम के नाम पे आप कोई कानून कानून बना दे कोई उसे नहीं हटा सकता अभी नवाज शरीफ के एक मिनिस्टर ने एक लफ्ज जो था वो ओथ का बदलने की कोशिश की तो क्या हुआ था उसके साथ पंजाब के गवर्नर को इन्होंने किस बे दर्दी से मारा उसने तो यही कहा था ना कि ये ब्लैसमी लॉ जो है ये अनसेफ है आपके बेचारा एक क्रिश्चियन जो था शबाज भट्टी आपका फेडरल मिनिस्टर उसको बेदर्दी से इन्होंने कत्ल किया मशल खान को किया बहावलपुर के अंदर इन्होंने वो एक प्रोफेसर को मार दिया है और हर रोज पिशावर के इलाके में किसी ना किसी ये अहमदी को ये गोली मार देते हैं वो क्योंकि अब रोज का न्यूज है तो उसका जिक्र नहीं होता श्रीलंकन का इसलिए हो गया है कि वो अब दुनिया के अंदर ट्रेड में फर्क पड़ेगा दुनिया में ये बातें होंगी ये नहीं ठीक हो सकते हो जाए तो ये आज के दौर का ट्वेंटी फर्स्ट सेंचुरी का सबसे बड़ा एक करिश्मा है लेस देन गॉड इंटरवीनिंग एंड चेंजिंग दिस extremists. and what would be then uh, the impact on uh, the immigrants living here since long you know see the the it's see the the thing is you can you can uh, from the political and social point of view do some analysis i think the prediction is very difficult what will happen but if you if you if you see that right wing extremism has reached really a point where the where it is now clashing with the with with the uh, against the the benefits of capitalism and even uh, neoliberalism so i think there will this fight will be much much more fought between the local governments and the local people uh, the to gain some mileage out of some populist uh, slogans that will continue and because you have to look at the the immigrant communities as well they not only want their own identity which is their right to have but they want to change the system and that is where dr ishtiaq also pointed out that this is the very big dilemma that that people come here migrate here and uh, they love it they absolutely love it and once they settle down in 2 3 years they love to change it then they think this country has to be changed and when they sit down in the evening sipping tea they say ये तो सत्यानाश है बेहयाई बेगैरती बच्चों को बाहर भेज दो वापस भेज दो ये कोई मुल्क है देन दे वांट टू चेंज इट सो इट इज इट इज दैट डायलेमा व्हिच इज आई थिंक विल विद दिस कंट्रडिक्शन विल कंटिन्यू पीपल डीप डाउन इन द बॉटम ऑफ देयर हार्ट्स दे नो दे हैव अ सेफ लाइफ हियर बीइंग इमिग्रेंट्स दे नो दे कैन एक्सरसाइज देयर रिलीजन देयर देयर इज रियली नो लिमिट टू इट यू जस्ट शो दैट 1200 न्यू मॉस्क्स हैव बीन बिल्ड इन लास्ट लास्ट 15 इयर्स so nobody is stopping them to 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 establish their identity or to, yes there is discrimination yes there are things which have to be improved but i think this situation is politically you will see more right wing uh, winning the ground in foreseeable future but uh, then there will be uh, backlashes and i think we hope so that the the concept of western democracy is going to prevail but not in the same shape as it is today thank you very much uh, uh, i would li- uh, like to ask hamna please unmute yourself and then we would go to masood mirza and amir murghai sahab and <clears throat> michael and rizwan khalid as well later hamna please assalam alaikum um thank you very much for for such an educated discussion and um um i'm i'm really thankful to you guys for educating us this day i am um, a regular o level teacher teacher 
But uh, my problem is like Mr. Kest said that I teach Islamic art and global perspective at the same time. So, you know, both the subjects go um, in, in points where, where you talk about pluralism and you talk about gender equality and you talk about a lot of mm -hmm. other things that have, you have to tell your children about. Uh, and then there's parallel to that Islamiyat and then like, you know, things go very um, difficult for me sometimes. Um, anyway, the question that I had to ask, um, Mr. Vahid has very beautifully summed it up because like, you know, when I listened to uh, Dr. Ishtiaq's discuss discussion on how the right wing is on, on the rise and how it's capitalizing on nationalism and identity and religious, religious beliefs and gender and everything. But on the other hand, Mr. Vahid talked about how neoliberalism is taking the, the world by storm, right? So I just wanted to ask that these two things are quite contradicting, that the new world order is, is it, is it the right wingers at the rise or, uh, you know, the neoliberalism and capitalism, which is dissolving all uh, norms and dissolving the boundaries and dissolving all other things that are there. So he has like, you know, summed it up already. Ke, uh, we ek clash hone wala hai, or contradiction hone wali hai, and how this, this is going to have a backlash and everything. And I think the, my question that I have to, I had to ask has already been answered. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, yeah. Masood Mirza, please, can you ask your question? Unmute uh, yourself, sir. Yes, yeah. please. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like first to express my shame uh, for being a Pakistani. What is happening to uh, minorities in Pakistan, and especially what happened uh, to Priyanka Kumara, his brutal killing. It is very, very shameful. And I am living in Germany for about half a century, but it was the first time that I felt so really ashamed. And my heart, like the hearts of many Pakistanis living in Europe, they are bleeding. So I would like to express our solidarity uh, for the minorities in Pakistan. Let us hope the situation would improve. Let us hope. Okay. Uh, one comment is that we were talking about South Asian Asia, uh, South Asia, South Asia. Maybe we didn't touch from this point of view. Uh, what happened in Indonesia in 1965? The coup d'état uh, staged by Suharto against Soekarno and Communist Party, and about one million people were killed at that time. And that uh, coup d'état was also engineered by CIA and by the British and the role of the British uh, intelligence agency is also very evident. Just a uh, side remark. Uh, you have also talked about the role of right-wing extremism in Pakistan. Just to have one remark, because a couplet from Farsi is coming into my mind, because Dr. Saib has also alluded to this thing about the laying the first bricks of Pakistan and Pakistan ideology. And this uh, couplet goes like this in Farsi. I would explain it. Kishte Awal, Chun Nehad, Memar Kaj, Ta Suraya, Meravad, Divar Kaj. It means that if the first brick is laid down, not in a leveled way, then not in a straight way, then even if you build, a, even if the architect build a, a wall till Senate, it would remain. Uh, how do you say, tilted, yeah? And this is uh, unfortunately the case of Pakistan because the friends of us who have read the book of, scholarly book of Dr. Ishtiaq Ahmed and the discussion of the constitutional debate about the, about the construct of Pakistan and ideology of Pakistan, then we, made, we, uh, we see that the formulation of objectives revolution and the definition of Pakistani identity and Pakistani ideology, then we see the seeds of what happened to us later because every country needs a, an identity and this discussion of identity because we also see in 1950s that former East Pakistan, there were discontentment and they wanted their rights. And also the minorities who were suppressed, being suppressed in West Pakistan, small minorities, and ethnic minorities, then a slogan was read, and that was, Islam is in danger. So this, this slogan we are he hearing from 
49, 50s, and then who the discussion? Who was the first pre, uh, the president of Pakistan? Uh, the name Re Republic of Pakistan or Islamic Republic of Pakistan? President must be Muslim or not? And this discussion that the ideological borders of Pakistan and thing. So my question is to, uh, to make it short. Sorry, it was a little bit elaborate. That the role of official narrative. What is the role? And that contributed, I think, I would like to hear your scholarly uh, opinion. I think our state, our official narrative has contributed this to this uh, um, uh, extremism, religious extremism. And I think official media has also played. So please, I would request you to give us a little bit more uh, input. Thank you very much. Uh, may I? May I? Yes, please. Yes, yeah. please. Very briefly, uh, Masood Mirza Saab, I am totally in agreement with you since yeah. my book, Jinnah, his successes, failures, and role in history, and another one, Pakistan, the garrison state, if read together, they established this very much, that the first brick was a tilted one, and therefore the, build, the building since then is a flawed one. But yeah. many states come into being in a very strange way. And so Pakistan can actually de-link itself and make an ideological jump if there is a leadership enlightened enough to do so. Uh, I think this is also in response to an earlier question that if we get a leadership which realizes that Pakistan is there to stay, you have a very strong military, army, whatever you want to call it, you have 222 20 million people to take care of. You have nuclear weapons to ensure that nobody attacks you. What more do you need? All you need to do is to accept that as Pakistan and stop interfering into pan-Islamic issues, Islamophobia, into anti-Indianism, into Kashmir being liberated. None of this is going to happen, may I tell you. You are only wasting your time. I think we have to wait for the post-Imran leadership because I don't think Imran Khan can really come back and, and disown all he has done. So we need a new leadership. And I, despite all the distressing things that we have discussed, my sense of history is that societies can make a break with their past and go on to create better societies. After all, uh, Pakistan is not the only state where there was so much extremism and terrorism and then people have rectified their societies and, and created better ones. South Korea is one. Uh, I would say Singapore is another great example. Uh, so things can happen, but you need a leadership which is devoted to serving the people of Pakistan. Don't give a damn. I mean, you are concerned about Kashmir, but what about the 400,000 Biharis who fought for you in East Pakistan? When uh, we do not let them come to Pakistan, but we want the Kashmiris in the Indian part and that Kashmir to be part of Pakistan. What is this? For me, this is a waste of time. Nobody is going to give you Kashmir on a plate. If you want to get it, fight a war and win it. And if you can't, then come to terms with the reality, establish good relations with India, have trade with them, open the borders, and do something like the European Union. That's the only way forward. Yeah. Can Thank I you. just interrupt? Yeah, please. Answer? There, yeah, is please. A, there is a question from Taira Abdullah Saiba, and she's asking, is there really an elected leadership in power today? Well, uh, she, she lives there and should, <laughs> should know much better than us. And I, uh, I, yeah. I, I, I think she, she knows the answer better than we do. Yeah, let me ask, uh, let me ask uh, um, uh, Dr. Amir Murgai, because uh, Dr. Amir Murgai has a uh, very keen eye uh, on um, you know, Islamophobia, immigration, immigration, immigrants okay. issues, discrimination in, especially in Holland and in the West. Amir Mughai, please ask your question or you want to comment. 
Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, are you are you listening to me? Or? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, 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 thank you. Now, thank you for uh, for this uh, discussion and presentations. And I have a couple of things to say. Uh, I would try to be short. Uh, one is that it is not, if you look, I mean, I mean, of course, this discussion is quite broad. I mean, you are covering the whole world for the last, um, I mean, a century or so, but it is not easy to cover it in one, uh, two hours, you know. But anyhow, um, it's not that uh, uh, in the post-colonial times, like countries like Egypt or Pan-Arabism or India, the post-colonial elite actually failed. The promises which it has made during the uh, independence movement, that uh, they will give, you know, the, uh, the, the, the promises which, you know, as an independence nation, they will give to the, to the public. I mean, you know, the, the, uh, the fall of, I mean, uh, uh, the Pan-Arabism, for example, and uh, uh, the Egyptian leader, you know, Nasser, and, uh, and the rise of uh, Islamism on, the, on that side. I mean, there is, there, I mean, there is also kind of social changes which are happening, which are also affecting what kind of new, uh, new uh, social uh, groups or movements which are emerging as a result of failure of the post-colonial, uh, uh, I mean, the post-colonial regimes in, 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 I mean, in, even in India, it is said that, you know, um, uh, the, the, when the emergency was imposed to the, the, by the Indira Gandhi, and, and that was also kind of failure of the of, of the democratic regime at, uh, government at the time, and and the eighties we see we you know as a part of the social new social development you know I, I don't know uh, perhaps you uh, somebody will know that uh, in the media you know there was a a, a big um, drama uh, uh, play which was about the about the Hindu his history, and uh, it was quite popular in India and even in Pakistan at the time. And people say that that drama, which gave a kind of uh, imaginary history of India, Hinduism, and that led to the kind of movement which uh, which further led to the um, the fall or or the demolishing of uh, Babri Masjid, for example, and the uh, emergence of the BJP in the end of the 90s. So I mean, uh, you are also I mean, in a way uh, talking about from the top down perspective, not the kind of social movements or the social developments that are happening in different. Uh, countries at a time which led to the the uh, uh, which which built on the kind of the failure of the post colonial elite. That's one uh, side of my story, and the second is about uh, in Europe, for example. I mean, I I am a bit uh, um, a bit disappointed in the sense that uh, um, uh, of, of course the the whole right wing issue in, in in Europe is quite vast, but I'm getting impression of it as if um, you know. Uh, the uh, the right wing has emerged as a result of the migration process here. I mean, which is quite uh, quite uh, surprising to say that uh, you know, even I mean, uh, you are missing the aspect that even the the symbolic um, uh, symbolic history, for example, before uh, even emerges. I mean, I mean, before even emerges of Islam or Muslim in these countries, there was a you know uh, the, the the guy who uh, uh, who um, uh, uh, did the massacre in New Zealand, the, and when he was doing that, he was listening to a song which goes about the for the 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 stopping of the Turks at the, at the Vienna. I mean that song was about that, you know. And then this uh, uh, new presidential candidate who has emerged in a, uh, in a France, and he's a, a extreme right wing, and he is he has basing his point on the conquest um, and the con conquest which was actually when Gauteng goes back to 1492 when Muslims were Muslim and Jews were expelled from uh, from uh, from Spain I mean th those kind of symbolic history which goes beyond you know the migration Muslim migration in these countries which is also kind of playing its role within the uh, uh, within the extreme right uh, groups in in, in, in in Europe and I just uh, listened to uh, Batisa which made, made comments which which says that you know um, I mean I perhaps I forget um, the, the exact nature of, but anyhow I, I mean I, I will stop it here because it runs a good uh, quite quite long yeah Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Amir Murgai. Um, uh, Dr. Ishtiaq wants to comment on it, on your 
Yeah. yeah, very quickly. I think I agree with Amir Morgai sahab that the post-colonial elites, the promises, I call them the erstwhile elite, the founding, the promises they made, they could not uh, deliver them. So that's definitely the case. The reason is that the freedom movements, at least in South Asia, were top down from day one. Many people at the bottom had no involvement in those movements. Okay, Mala, uh, Mahatma Gandhi could pull millions into the streets, uh, but still there were all the other millions who were quite content with British rule. I mean, this is a tragedy that we have to acknowledge. But I'll come to the second one about this, uh, the New Zealander talking about the Turks knocking at the doors of Vienna, uh, this is obviously part of the historical selective memory. Amir Bogari Sab, Dr. Sab, you must realize that people draw on the past selectively. So this is the story they carry into the future when, when the all white Dutch, all white British, all white French nations are no longer in that old form. And you have all these immigrants coming in with their different languages, with their different looks, with their different social behavior codes, with their cultural differences. So they bring back all those selective memories from the past when the Turk was doing it and when the Arabs were doing it. I mean, this is how things happen. And if you look at the voting pattern, until the 70s, I mean, I've lived in Sweden 48 years. These were laughing stock. There were people who were uh, anti Jewish, anti Semitic, maybe anti Muslim. Most of them are now more anti Muslim than anti Jewish because there are no Jews around to hate. So it's the same continuity. But the threat is that these people are there as a Trojan horse. You know, there have been stupid people from Turkey, you know, inviting this Islamist from Turkey and giving him the key of Berlin, saying from now onwards, Berlin is Islamic. All this has happened in front of us. So you provoke them, then you give them a constituency to go out and create fear among the masses. Their voting strength is still between 20 and 10, I think, in some places more. But Unlike, or I think more like Mirza uh, Bhatti Sahib, I don't think Western democracy is out to give them a walkover, not at all. I think they will be defeated. Their numbers will increase. And as rightly, uh, as Bhatti Sahib said, uh, uh, all politics have moved to the right, but that's how, that's how democracy functions. You move to the right, you move to the left, you move to the middle in order to keep the extremes out. So that's what democracy is all about. Keep the extremes out. May, I add, some, may I add something here? Uh, small. Can I, can, I just, uh, yeah. can I just add something to what Dr. Ishtiak said to the second part of the question? I think I maybe uh, somehow uh, Murgaisa misunderstood because if you if you recall what I was uh, the, the way I was building up the argument, I think immigration was a pretty small part of it. And 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 I said that in the context that right-wing extremists are using immigration as one very big argument, which they see as a threat to their culture to keep their purity. Uh, and this is the definition of conservatives, whether the conservatives are, uh, are on our side, in, our, in Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, or Indonesia, or whether they are in the Western countries, they all have their imaginary or real glorious uh, moments of the past which they think they can bring back or they can go back in the history, fight them and correct them. So this is precisely, and that's why it is all very symbolic politics. I mean, we hear our politician quoting these kinds of examples every day in Pakistan, you see that some pick out some incidents from the history and glorify them. And like, uh, and, and you, we have a big slogan of riyasat e madina these days. This is exactly that's nostalgia. Exactly. And that expectation that we can bring back that glory, uh, which probably existed or didn't exist. It's a, it's a matter of argument. And I think the other point of Murgai Sahib is he, right, that the elite, and this is true for 
I think almost 99% of the movements which are created and led by elite that they over promise uh, to, to give you certain things if you, if you agree with them, you follow them, vote for them, et cetera, et cetera, knowing very well that half of those promises can never, be, can never become true. So that's what I just wanted to add to it. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Isyak, Dr. Murgai, and uh, Wahid Bhatti uh, There is a question, uh, uh, you know, some others um, participants want. Michael, can you sp uh, please briefly ask your question? Yes, um, th thank you very much everybody about, for this uh, fantastic uh, event. Um, what I wanted to ask was, uh, what do you think the impact of Saudi Arabia opening cinemas, allowing 21 year old girls to travel and recently hosting the major festival, opening cinemas, etc., on the in, in, on the Islamic world? Thank you, Dr. Sir. Uh, well, I think uh, this is the positive thing because this is the center of Islamism. And if they change their ways, it will percolate in other societies as well, especially those societies which are heavily dependent on their dole, you know. Pakistan keeps getting money from the Saudis and the Saudis wouldn't give money without requiring Pakistan to, uh, uh, you know, change its course in some way. The thing is that this regime cannot do it. I'm just saying this. A new government may fall in line with the Saudi uh, uh, approach now. But I think with Imran Khan and his Islamophobia and his fixation with Islam, that's not possible. I don't think he can do it. That's all. But I think this is a major positive change which has taken place. And it is bound to have a benign effect overall on the Muslim world sooner or later. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rizwan Khalid and uh, Rahman Sufi, please, uh, both of you uh, can ask questions one by one. Ji Rizwan, uh, unmute yourself. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for an excellent, excellent discussion. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, if Kaisa Saab is still around, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, there's other progressives around you uh, hopefully, uh, you will get contacts of other people as well. But you know, uh, uh, it, it's a it's a it's it's a difficult battle. It's an uphill task. But hopefully, you'll keep at it. Uh, I happen to teach uh, here in Pakistan, here in Lahore as well. Uh, and you know, uh, perhaps uh, I will send you privately my email address as well in in the mm -hmm. chat, and, and and you know, we can we can get get in touch. Now, having said that, whereas this is uh, an uphill battle, uh, it, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm completely hopeless about uh, any kind of success. So, I mean, all I would say is the, uh, the best thing that we can do at this point is, you know, just have friendly faces around where you can just chit chat a bit or uh, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, I wanted, uh, the question that I wanted to ask now, uh, and, and I would uh, really uh, like it if both Wahid Saab and Ishtak Saab could, could respond. Uh, my question is, okay, uh, I have this feeling uh, that uh, when the West loses uh, the, uh, the authority uh, when it comes to something like uh, human rights, uh, by uh, include uh, by uh, by uh, by actions like Guantanamo Bay and, and 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 all the other things that have happened, uh, many of which have been recounted, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to fight for and to argue for uh, for for supremacy of human rights uh, in a place like Pakistan. Uh, and, you know, I mean, with, with this increasing polarization that we're having, uh, like uh, with, I don't know if any of you have uh, had the chance to have a look at some of the statements that are made by the current chief of the Rehmatul Alameen uh, authority that's just been set up by Imran Khan. And those are just horrendous. 
uh, this chap happens to have a very twisted worldview, and and uh, it seems we're just going to keep on regressing. Uh, but one of the things that that uh, I'd like to build upon is that he himself has used this particular thing that it's it's become very common now uh, uh, by uh, it's become a very common ploy by the conservative segment in Pakistan to simply say, look, there is no uh, uh, absolute freedom of expression. There is no absolute uh, uh, human rights everywhere. And every society just deems for themselves what is good and what is bad. And, and you know, that's what we're going to be doing. So, so, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Rahman, uh, Sufi, can you please ask your question as well? Hi, thank you so much for uh, the discussion and I enjoyed the presentations as well. Um, uh, my question is twofold. One is about the trend that we see rightwards all across the globe. I wonder if it is really new. Um, I feel like it's been going in cycles throughout historical phases and it's linked to an absence of a politics that people can get behind. And that is very much the case in Pakistan, for instance. But um, when you see that um, the left is getting uh, moving more and more towards the center or even to the right, and you see that the right is getting more and more extremist, um, I feel like part of that is mm -hmm. a failure of um, people who are concerned with liberation and democracy and freedom um, to put forward a political agenda, which talks about how to create a better world. Um, and that is definitely something that I see really lacking in Pakistan as well. The left parties are small. A lot of them are stuck in like the Maoist or old form of Marxism. And uh, we seem to be really out of touch with um, creating new forms of um, organizing and thinking about politics and how to move forward, because it's not all doom and gloom. Um, we know that people are concerned with liberation. People do strive for liberation. And we can harness that for the greater good. So my question is, in Pakistan, specifically, um, traditional, like historically, we haven't had such um, popular backing for Islamist parties, as far as I know. But now you see that changing a little bit, especially with the TLP. And part of the pro problem is that not a lot of people are involved in politics, and they've kind of stepped back because of this shrinking of space for engagement with politics, for social democracy, you know, which is uh, extremely important. So my question is, what is your analysis of that situation? Is it really changing or is it just um, a superficial phenomenon? Um, are more and more people really going towards um, this um, um, really right-wing, Islamist politics that the TLP represents, for example, or the IGI, um, the Jamiat Islami. Um, and, and one of the things that comes to the fore in all of this and the lack of politics is a question of identity, that because of this lack of politics and being unable to feel part of a larger uh, whole where you see yourself as progressing towards a common goal, you are seeing, um, trying to ally yourself with whatever is emergent, whatever is more powerful around you. And that I feel really um, is the case with this, um, the mob mentality in Pakistan, what's been happening with people be taking things in their own hands. And it's, it seems like an act of desperation, of course, but behind it is a lack of identity, like it, um, uh, uh, identifying with a politics that they see as viable. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, both of these questions. Uh, I just want to add as well uh, something, and then I would ask Vahid Saab and uh, Dr. Ishaq to respond. So, 
uh, in practice, if we see in Pakistan as well here in West Muslim especially, they they are doing something else, and uh, uh, you know chanting slogans uh, for something else. Uh, it is a great uh, you know controversies about their practices and. Uh, when they, they come up uh, on certain uh, social media or political platforms. So then w- how, how they uh, claim uh, or how they can discuss or assert their identity. Yeah, please. So uh, who's going to speak first? Wait, sir. sir, you please go. Achha. Well, first of all, uh, Dr. Rizwan Khaled's concern about human rights, I totally agree. In foreign policy, uh, uh, human rights is usually not a very important priority of states. I mean, much before what is happening elsewhere or Gontama Bay incident and all, uh, Bill Clinton, when he was dealing with the Chinese, uh, there was an open criticism that he didn't take up human rights violations in China. Why? Because China was the big opportunity for everyone to make a buck, you know, and so they put it on the side. So that's true. As long as human rights is not part of an international movement of all progressive enlightened people, that we want them to be respected, preserved, constitutionally guaranteed, this is not going to happen. About Rahman, Sufi Saiba's concern that uh, the Islamic parties were never electorally very big. That is true, but I think this is a fallacy. I've explained it to I don't know how many uh, audiences that the Pakistani state is Islamist. The constitution of Pakistan is Islamist. The president will be a Muslim. The prime minister will be a Muslim who must under oath say that they believe in the finality of the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad. All laws of Pakistan are to be brought in consonant with Islam, with Quran and Sunnah. This is all there in the constitution. So whether it is People's Party or it is uh, P- uh, PMLN or PMLQ or PTI, all of them are Islamist parties. You don't have any secular party in Pakistan as against the Indian constitution, where there's a clean, clear distinction between the state and religion. There is no state religion. All men and women are equal citizens, entitled to the same rights. We have differential rights. For MDs, one type of rights. For non-Muslims, another set of rights. And then for the Muslims, we have declared all the rights, but we violate them all the time. So Pakistan, what you are now witnessing is that this ugly feature of using Islamism is now like uh, uh, it has come home to roost, as they say, you know, the chickens have come home to roost. Now they are doing things which we're doing in, in the Indian Kashmir or in India or in Afghanistan, all in the name of Islam. Now when those theaters are not available, they do it to the minorities in Pakistan. That's the problem. The Pakistani state is ideologically doomed. Unless it makes a break with it, there is no chance that things will improve at all. May I have finished? Yeah, doctor, uh, sorry, Wahid Bhattisa, please. I don't, I, <clears throat> again, I, I, I agree with uh, like Dr. Saab with some of the things which have been said. Uh, as for the human rights, I think we, there is so much evidence and so many stories that it is actually nothing more than uh, a stick in the toolbox uh, of, of uh, Western countries uh, uh, to use them whenever they want to use against any country or against any party. I think the, it, it's if some impression has been created that we are pro-West, I just wanted to make sure that that's, that's, that's not the case. We are, uh, if we are saying immigrants do some things here, bad or negative, it doesn't mean we are, we have just become pro-West. We are just trying to find the, the right kind of ground why, why this is happening. Uh, 
And the reason we have been discussing this because the topic today is the rise of the uh, uh, extreme uh, right extremism. But certainly when we will be talking about the failures of the left, we will be touching upon lots of uh, points which Rahman Sufi particularly raised. Yes, it has been partly a failure or inability of the left to unite, to put a political platform, to put a political program together, uh, which is a kind of counter program. But that's also then question of your resources. And as doctors have rightfully pointed out, you, are, you have a state which is by law a fundamentalist state. And to, to do anything progressive or to put up any progressive platform can easily be interpreted as anti-state activity. Exactly. So this, this becomes a very delicate, because uh, the Jamaat Islami, which used to be the most radical uh, rightist party, is now left behind by many other radical groups. And why this is happening? Because if you are a fundamentally a, a rightist state or a fundamentalist state, every party has to be more radical than the previous party to attract public. And, and then the next one, which comes, is even more aggressive, is even more radical towards the right, because this is how you, you compete against each other. And you have always one foot up against uh, what happened last year. And that's how we are multiplying. And don't forget then the, the education system in Pakistan, which has been installed right from the beginning, which is no access for masses, uh, bad access for masses. Uh, elite system is separated from the masses. Masses have been going for now ages to madrasas. And you, I'm sure you have seen tons of uh, videos on, on social media these days, what they are taught in those madrasas. So we have this whole army of, uh, and then this collaboration between the mainstream parties and, 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 uh, and uh, the religious parties, even Nawaz Sharif, if he wants to come out for protest, he has to go to Fadlur Rahman to ask, uh, yeah, supply me 10,000 people because I need them for a demonstration. So this is how this collaboration is, is, is kind of uh, uh, evolving. And as for the disorientation, you are absolutely right. If you haven't, I would simply recommend to, to read the book uh, by uh, Naomi Klein, which is called The Shock Doctrine, how you can shock people first to disorient them and then to you change them into whatever you want them to be. So this is the process which has been going, uh, uh, going in our country. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sho. Um, actually, our time is ended, and I want to close the official uh, dialogue, and then we'd, we, uh, we would remain here uh, for almost uh, uh, more than half hour to discuss and uh, communicate with each other for, for the networking purpose as well. Uh, so let can me. I, uh, can, I, can I just add, since you are closing, just just to say a couple of more lines, if you allow me to, please. Uh, see, uh, because the question was also asked, and partly I think uh, doctors have nicely touched upon it. That that what should we do? What should be our? And it has to be a break from the past. And I think in in the last analysis. Uh, it is really how we view ourselves and how we redefine ourselves and how we define our society and our nation. Uh, I mean, I won't take example of Pakistan, but say, say Holland or Germany. If we say uh, Netherlands is a country of Dutch people, right? So who are Dutch people? And by a kind of implication, we say they are either Christian or they are secular. So when we define them and they are white, so what we do is by having this kind of definition of Dutch or German people, we are excluding a sizable portion of the population. Why? Because they simply, they are foreign, they are alien, and they are really not part of us. And if they are not part of us historically, they are here to destroy us and they can only dilute our culture. So we have to understand that in case of Pakistan or every single country, and we have to be much more, much clearer about of a lot of these implicit assumptions uh, that we have had about our society in terms of ethnicity, religion, and other things. Because the fundamentally, if only, now see, it's not only by constitution that a prize prime minister and president, but it's not written, but in this atmosphere, you can't have a non-Muslim, even a commissioner, uh, even a senior position in armed forces, a commissioner of a big city, 
uh, even head of a large corporation. Uh, it, it has become so terrifying, the whole atmosphere. I mean, Sharia complying companies, uh, how they are conducting business, the kind of atmosphere which has been created. If we continue with that appeasement, and that thing will only grow and multiply. So we have to somehow, somewhere take a step back and say, come on, let's have this uh, back, come to Jesus kind of meeting and say, who are we and what kind of uh, country we are, what kind of nation we want to be uh, and what is our identity? Because it will not help if we de-link ourselves with the three and a half thousand his, uh, years of history of our own territory piece of land. And we try to start imagining that no, our identity started the day Mohammed bin Qasim landed in Sindh. That's the day, the zero point when our identity started. No, it did not. It is started three and a half thousand years before that. And if we are not proud of that, and we try to erase it from the history books and rewrite the history, an imaginary history, we are building on, on, on the crooked brick, as uh, Mirza Saab said. So this is what I wanted to say just as the closing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dr. Isyak want to say something, please, Dr. Saab. Yeah, I think the question of identity and how to deal with it, there is a constitutional way of doing it. There are two models of nationalism or nation-ness. One is the French model, which says all those who live on a particular territory and are bona fide, yani legally entitled to live there, they are part of the nation, irrespective of their religion, their caste, their race, their ethnicity, their language, whatever. Those who are accepted as Dutch, you know, legally naturalized citizens and natural born citizens, they are all Dutch. If we approach that, then this is a universal, inclusive, pluralist model where there are two distinctions. At the level of citizenship, all citizens enjoy the same rights and the same obligations or duties. Then there is a second tier, it's called the rights of community. As a private individual, you can belong to a Muslim group, a Muslim sect, or to a dance club. That's your freedom to be a member of so many other uh, 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 associations. But the primary association in which your loyalty is rooted must be the state and the state project. So if you do that, then you can succeed. The second is the German model, which has created so much havoc in the world, you know, where you are born into a nation because you belong to its religion or to its race. And on that basis, if you are in one territory, those who don't fit in, they are not part of the nation. So you, so you introduce laws to discriminate against them. And you can even wage war saying like, like Hitler said that Germans living in Czechoslovakia and Poland belong to the great German nation. So we are going to invade and bring them together in one nation. So I think the German model in all its forms has to be rejected mm -hmm. uh, intellectually and all of us, even in Pakistan, must go for the French model. May I underline that the founders of modern India based their nation and the rights of citizens on the French model. So there's a big difference. So these are the two choices. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saab. Uh, let me uh, conclude this uh, 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 discussion. Uh, by just uh, giving uh, a, a little quote. Uh, as the question grow harder and more complicated, people yearn for simpler answers. One sentence answer, answers that point unhesitatingly to a culprit who can be blamed for all our sufferings. Answer that prom uh, promise that if we only eradicate the villains, all our troubles will vanish. Obviously, it cannot be done. Cannot so be. The, the, the next uh, is from uh, Martin. Uh, first, they came for the communists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I was a pro protestant. 
Then they came for me. And by that time, there was no one left to speak up for me. So this is a duty for all of us to actually collaborate with the saner people in the world and join uh, and, uh, you know, uh, 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 strengthen their hands, join their platforms, uh, promote such a dialogues when we want, when we have time, or we can take time uh, for that to, to educate people, to, uh, to dialogue with the people in a very uh, uh, humble way, in a very informative way, in a very educative way. Uh, so thank you very much uh, um, uh, from Overseas Progressive Pakistanis team. Uh, there are, uh, we, uh, our presence is there on online, uh, we have uh, our website, we have uh, Gmail uh, contact, you can email us. We have uh, presence on Facebook, Twitter, mm -hmm. and uh, on um, our uh, uh, YouTube. So uh, please uh, uh, keep uh, joining uh, and keep strengthening us, uh, keep promoting such a dialogues. The video of that this dialogue as well would be uploaded on our YouTube and on our website. You can share it with the people who want to listen, who want to understand. And thank you very much. I'm going to close officially, but we would remain here for more than half hour. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ishtiak Ahmed. Thank you very much, Wahid Bhatti Sahab. And thank you all of you nice people who have joined us today. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ji. I'm greatly inspired that we have such a network and we can discuss things. Thank you. <laughs>